Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church.
I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer that we live, but Christ lives within us.
So he who is in me is stronger than he who is in the world. Can you say that out loud? He who is in me is stronger than he who is in the world. Get a hold of that today. What power you have with Jesus Christ? His power, not our power. That's why nothing is impossible with our God. A great and awesome God worthy of our praises. So some of us have been praying for things for a long time. I know I have. We're going to sing a song. There is a cloud. There's a cloud in the distance. God's promises always come true. He's never failed yet. God has his ways of working things out for the best for those who love him. God is awesome, isn't he? Isn't he awesome? Isn't he great?
await the promise to come. Everything that you have spoken will come to pass and let it be done. Receive his reign upon your life, the Holy Spirit, gentle Holy Spirit, precious Holy Spirit. The reign, receive his promises, receive his hope. All that is within me, bless your holy name. Give my life to worship you, Lord, to worship you, Lord. That's what you're created to do, is worship God. Give our lives to worship him. Forever we will sing of his great love. He is so great, so awesome, and worthy of our praises today. Worthy is
Jesus. How special, how special you are. Every sunrise, the colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, you're beautiful.
together I see you there hanging on a tree You bled and then you died and then you rose again
Appreciation Day about some things about the ministry and Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 I'd like to read that again as we come to God's word here this morning Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 where the scripture says this every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself is also beset with weakness. And because he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. No one takes the honor to himself, but he receives it when he is called by God, as Aaron was. When I think about the ministry, I guess 41 years, into it, this is the verse that really comes most to mind to me. When you enter the ministry, you kind of have this feeling, you know, as a young guy, you kind of have this feeling like that uh, you're out to conquer the world, you know, for Christ. And you quickly find out that there's a lot in you that God has to conquer. And you, you remain a work in progress, you know, as you continue on in your ministry. And God doesn't call superstars. God calls people who are beset with weaknesses. And I'm not primarily talking about moral weaknesses. I'm talking about people who are beset by problems and difficulties. Anyone here qualify? You, you sometimes feel like you're beset by problems and weaknesses and you don't have all the answers. Uh, I learned a long time ago, I don't have all the answers and I don't have to have all the answers. There's some things that you just are content to say, God, I leave it with you. I don't know. I remember when I first met Rosanna, one of the things that she told me later on was in the, we were in a hospital setting and someone was very ill that she loves and cares about and she asked, why? And I said, I don't know why. And, and years later she came to me and she said, that was something like, that was so refreshing that you know, somebody didn't have all the answers to everything. And uh, I don't, I don't have all the answers to everything. But I sure know who does. I sure know who does. And when we think about, it's what makes us relevant to people. Because it's a hurting world, and there's a lot of problems in the world. People have problems and difficulties. The other night, I took Charlene to the emergency room. She was having some difficulty with her blood pressure. And you know, you go to the emergency room, you're, you're there for a long time, usually. Yeah. Five, six hours, you know, something like that. And uh, they took her back, and they were, you know, running all the basics on her. So I'm sitting out in the, the, the seating area, and I'm just looking at all the people who are gathering there. This was at Mercy Hospital down in Pittsburgh. And I was thinking, man, I mean, there's just so many people have so many problems in this world. And what makes us relevant is that we have found Christ in our lives to rely upon through the problems that we have and we trust that he has an answer for those problems Wh whether they're the ones we want or not isn't really the issue it's he does have an answer for all of our problems and that's what makes us relevant if God calls people who never had a problem or never had a difficulty we would be irrelevant to most of the world because where most of the world lives there's things that happen that are beyond our control things that we wish had never happened we have regrets we have disappointments we have our own wounds and our own hurts that we pick up as we go through life and as we look around everyone else is in the same position but we found Christ in the midst of all those problems and we rely upon him and we have a relationship with him so we're appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God we're meant to be out there where people are hurting to represent the things of God before people. So 
Lots of scriptures about that. Let your light shine before men, you know, in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify not you, but your Father who is in heaven. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Let, let, it, let it shine. Let it give light to all who are in the house. You're a city set on a hill. You can't be hidden. You know, that's what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to, to hide his truth and his reality. People need to see it. They may not like it, but they still need to see it, whether they like it or not, because I didn't like it at one time in my life. And probably you didn't like it at one time in your life. But thank God, somebody, somewhere along the way, let the light shine into your life. And eventually it clicked. Right? So it's not about people liking it, it's about letting it shine and putting a challenge out there that others can see. And because we've had weakness in our lives, we learn to deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided because we ourselves are also beset with weakness. When people mess up, most of the time they already know they've messed up. And it's not that you don't have to say something to them, but it's how you say it. And it's what you're communicating as you say it. I love the story of the Good Samaritan. Here's this guy, you know, he's been beat up by robbers. He's left for dead. And, and the people who should have known better ignore him and pass on the other side. And finally, the Samaritan, who didn't really even have a reason to help, decides he's going to do something. And he goes to this guy who's, who's been beat up and just left on the side probably to die. And, and he picks him up, and of his own money, he puts his own resources into this. He goes to the innkeeper and, and says, you know, take care of this guy and put it to my charge. And when I come back, I'm going to pay you for this. And, you know, what he doesn't say to the guy who was beat up is just as important as what he says. He doesn't say, you fool, what is wrong with you? Why would you go down that road? Everybody knows there's robbers. You idiot, you got what you deserved. Said that so loud, I knocked my headpiece off. <laughs> That's not what he did. And probably after the guy got better, there was a good opportunity for a conversation a reasonable one. You know, friend, in the future, don't go that way. Right? The people who make mistakes in life, is there anyone in this room who's never made a mistake in life? We've all made mistakes in life. And isn't it isn't a good conversation, you know, friend, don't go that way anymore. The reason God doesn't want you to go that way is because it's a dangerous road and it will hurt you. Isn't that better than, you fool! I mean, you know, which one would you accept to change your life better? Most of us wouldn't accept being shouted at. Right? So we, too, we're beset with weakness. I, I think God likes to keep us in a place of weakness because it's when, we're, when we know that we have a weakness. And again, I'm not really primarily talking about moral things. I'm just talking about our need for God. We know we need God. We know we need him. And, and that's why we're kept in weakness, so that we know that we need him. We're not under any illusion. We need God. I need God. I need him. And so do you. That's right. It's an honor that no one takes to himself, but he receives it when he's called of God, even when Aaron, even as Aaron was called of God. Last week we talk, talked a little bit about one of the ways that Aaron was called of God. This plague breaks out. People are dying everywhere. Moses says to Aaron, take some incense, take some fire. Run! Get in the middle of these people and make atonement for their sin. 
Aaron's 80 years old. He's like, <laughs> he's not the best qualified. You know, he wasn't Joshua, this young, strong guy who could just, boom, get it done. He, but he got it done, didn't he? And where he stood, the plague stopped, and he stood between the living and the dead. And I believe in our communities and where we live, God wants his people to stand between the living and the dead. He wants us to be those who cause the plague to stop because of his atonement that he's already made for them. But we gotta get some fire. And even if we don't run real well, we gotta run. I mean, there has to be an urgency to us about what's taking place. And sometimes we go, God, you know, well, why didn't you call a younger person? Do you know Catherine Kuhlman asked that? She prayed in her 60s. You know, God, why did you wait till I was in my 60s before these miracles and these healings began to take place? She just said the Lord seemed to tell her because you weren't ready. By the way, I love being in my 60s. It is so great. I don't feel driven. I'm not used to that, you know. <laughs> Pastors are used to feeling driven. Your, your motor's running all the time, 12 hours a day, all day, every week. You know, it's like, you're going, going. And I'm in my 60s, I'm like, huh. I wish I'd have been in my 60s in my 30s, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes the proper working of each individual part and we're so thankful Romans chapter 12 verses 4 and 5 for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 20. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And each one in the body has gifts that other people in the body do not have. You are able to reach people that I will never be able to reach. And maybe I can reach some that you won't be able to reach. But that's the God's design, isn't it? We all have our place. We all have our role. And it's very important in the body of Christ that, that we accept the responsibility to function properly as the part of the body that we are. And if you don't know what part of the body you are, pick something and try it and see if the shoe fits. Right? Look around. You know, I remember one time... <laughs> Uh, it was like two minutes before 10 o'clock. This was years ago, so you will never figure out who it was, and I don't even remember who it was myself. But uh, it was like two minutes before 10. We're just getting ready to start the service, and somebody came to me on the platform, and they said, Pastor Dan, you better open the doors on Madeline Street because they're locked. And I thought, couldn't you have just opened the doors? <laughs> I mean, what is it that you have to come and tell me about that because it's, we're ready to start? But dutifully, I went out and I opened the doors on Madeline Street. But, you know, it just, we just, some of this is just common sense kind of stuff. We have challenges. We face the same temptations, if you would, that the American church faces because we are in America. We are part of the American church. And Charlene identified some of the hindrances in the American church. It's self-will. We just want what we want, and we don't really care what God wants sometimes. We want the flesh to have its way. We, we don't care what the Bible says about some things. We just want to do it because we want to do it. That's self-will, that's self-centeredness. It, you know, it's not all about us. It was really liberating for me as a pastor when I came to a conclusion that 
neither God nor anyone else owed me a big ministry. You grow up, you think, you know, it's owed to you, it's due you, it's, you know, it's owed. You know what? It's not owed. There's nothing owed. It's God's choice. And whatever size it is, if I'm not faithful to do my very best, there's something wrong inside of me. And God doesn't owe us, you know, a fully staffed nursery. Or God doesn't owe us. I mean, it'd be nice to have, and we trust one day we will, but we're not owed it. You know what we, we owe? We're not owed. We owe. We owe him our best. We owe him our faithful commitment. We owe. We're not owed. And anything that God blesses us with is, is extra. Because actually we owe him our very lives. So, you know, we have to have the right priority. It's not all about us. The American church struggles with giving God control of our time. We find plenty of things to do with our time that keep us from God's best sometimes. We get, the Bible says, uh, no one who serves as a soldier gets dominated by the affairs of this life because they want to please the one who is their commander, the one who called them. Nobody gets overly involved in the things of this life. But how many of you know it is really easy to get overly involved in the things of this life? It is easy. And we swim against the stream to fight that, but keep swimming. Keep swimming against the stream because it's worth it. We get to the point where, where God's in control of our time and how we use it, what we use it on. That's a great thing. Well, we have the same temptation as the American church because we're part of it with our money. What do we use our money for? Do, you know, do we prioritize the Lord? And do we prioritize bringing our tithe to the church? Or do we make excuses? And I can't do that because of this. I can't do that because of that. I have all these reasons not to do it. You know what? I have a lot of reasons not to do it too, but I do it. I've done it my whole life. And I'm not going to stop because I believe more than what's in it for me, I believe God deserves it. I believe it. So, you know, what do we do with our money? And, and what do we really waste our money on? Another thing that we have to fight against is overly pleasing people being people pleasers, not taking a stand for Jesus when we should because we're worried about this person's going to think this or, you know, what, they, they, they don't want us to do that. So we're overly worried about their opinion. You know, I, I'm sort of a, a gentle person, but I do believe that I have to honor him before I honor other people. And I may approach that in a gentle fashion, but I do. And I have plan Bs in the back of my mind when I get myself in situations where I think I'm going to have to make a choice about pleasing God or pleasing other people. If you're in a Nepali home and they start doing some Hindu things, <laughs> I pick up my cell phone. Oh! <laughs> and walk out. Don't tell them. <laughs> because I have to please him before I please other people. Amen? People put pressure on us. You know, oh, you know, Sunday morning we're going to get together at 11 o'clock at the restaurant. Hi. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. 
We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church.